My name is Carrie Bush, and I thank you all for coming and listening to my persuasive speech on why abortion is unconstitutional. Make no mistake, abortion on demand is not a right guaranteed by the Constitution. No serious scholar, including one disposed to agree with the court's result, has argued that the framers of the Constitution intended to create such a right. These are the words of the 40th President of the United States of America, President Ronald Reagan, in 1983. President Reagan, in his deep respect for our beloved U.S. Constitution, understood that the arguments presented to the Supreme Court in 1973 during Roe v. Wade were flawed at best. According to the Allen Guttenmacher Institute, roughly one to one and a half million babies are aborted each year in the United States. That's roughly 50 million babies that have been aborted since this decision. When Jane Roe had an unplanned pregnancy that she wanted to terminate, she was told that it was illegal in the state of Texas because of their criminal abortion statute. She brought her case before the Supreme Court in hopes that they would deem the criminal abortion statute unconstitutional. So that's where Roe v. Wade began. But how did it end? Justice Harry Blackman delivered the opinion of the court to be such that the statute violates the Due Process Clause in the 14th Amendment. The court decided that the Constitution does not define person in so many words. Therefore, an unborn child cannot be granted the rights in the 14th Amendment that would ensure its right to life. However, Justice Blackman also said that, quote, if this suggestion of personhood is it ever established, the appellant's case, of course, collapses, for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the amendment. So what is a person? A person is defined in Webster's Dictionary as an individual human being. While the abortion lobby argues that the fetus is merely a piece of tissue, much like a tumor, that belongs solely to the woman, I would point out that an unborn baby has its own complete set of DNA. Furthermore, how can a woman with her female chromosomes carry a male child with his own male chromosomes if the mother and the child are not two distinct separate persons. In other words, they're individual human beings as defined by Webster. Pro-choice advocates often want to define personhood as something that develops as we grow through the stages of life. As you can see here, once a child is conceived, all he or she needs is time and nourishment. To make its entrance into the world. And then, does he stop growing? Of course not. He will continue to grow and to develop until the day that he dies. Furthermore, there have been two federal laws signed within the past 10 years that significantly support the argument of fetal personhood. The first, the Born Alive Infant Protection Act signed in 2002, requires medical personnel to give treatment in the event that an abortion fails and an infant is born alive. Babies who survive attempted abortions are more likely to have mental and physical disabilities. Gianna Jensen, an abortion survivor who very much considers herself a person, lives with a disability as a result of a botched saline abortion. She and many others like her suffer from diseases such as cerebral palsy and blindness. This is understandable, seeing as how they, when they were in the womb, before they were officially a person, someone was burning them alive with a saline solution, or trying to dismember them limb from limb, or perhaps even attempting to suck their non-person brains out. My question is this, at what point during that magical journey down the birth canal does a child become worthy of the title person? The second law that proves fetal personhood is the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, signed in 2004, also known as Lacey and Connor's Law. This law recognizes a child in utero as a legal victim, and the text defines child in utero as, quote, 
a member of the species Homo sapiens at any stage of development who is carried in the womb. This law speaks volumes to the special personhood of children in the womb. One could not imagine that a criminal could possibly be tried and convicted and sentenced to capital punishment for killing an unborn piece of tissue. The Connor of Lacey and Connor's law was the grandchild of the Roca family and was just as devastating of a loss as was his mother, Lacey. Even though Connor never saw the light of day, he was a person. He had a name and he had a family. Before their untimely death, Lacey was so devoted to the little unborn person in her womb that she gave him a name. Since 1973, many advances in technology have practically opened up the womb for us grown-ups to take a peek. Photographs taken in utero, surgery performed on unborn children, and even four-dimensional ultrasounds. I dare say no woman having an ultrasound on a tumor or on a cyst has ever seen that tumor or cyst reach up and suck its thumb or react to touch. No woman has ever been awakened from sleep with a blob of tissue which has had the hiccups or that's kicked her. Legally, scientifically, medically, personhood of the unborn child has been established. Therefore, based on Justice Blackman's own written opinion, if this suggestion of personhood is established, the appellant's case of course collapses, for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the amendment.